Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful, so very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word together. Father, we just praise you that, that we have that fellowship in the gospel, that it is God at work in us both the will and do of his good pleasure. I thank you for that unity, for that bond, that we stand before you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in your sight, that you long to be with us as we do you. I just ask your blessings upon this study, your continued blessings upon this ministry. I pray for all of those who are, who are following this ministry, that you would open their eyes and their hearts to understand the peace that passes all understanding. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that, that you've given us to exalt Christ. Take charge of this time and just filter out all of that which is ignorant, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in the uh, epistle to the Philippians, verse by verse, or... Uh, in, uh, we've been crawling along in the second chapter, uh, somewhere around the, the, the verses uh, 12 and 13, I believe. We're going to start looking at uh, the text from verse 14 on. If you followed this study, uh, and you know that we've uh, looked, t taken a serious, a hard look, or at least we've tried to, the, at the past several verses, at how God is working in us both the will and do of his good pleasure. Uh, and now I think that we're going to move over into a portion of the text in which we see the effects of that in our lives, which are really quite remarkable. Uh, since we began this study, we've, we've seen that, uh, I've, well, I've reminded you from the beginning that we're looking at uh, not Paul's logic we're looking at the uh, the Holy Spirit uh, in speaking, uh, writing, using Paul to write to the church at Philippi. And it's important to understand and keep into context, I believe, the fact that we're looking at a church context. That is extremely important as we go through this, I think, that we need to keep that in mind. Uh, we're looking at uh, not just Paul's feelings toward the Philippians, but we're looking at God's feelings toward us. Uh, we've taken into uh, account, taken into consideration just who Paul was, uh, Pharisee of Pharisees, uh, uh, his experience, uh, his walk, his relationship with the Lord, uh, which was diametrically opposed to to all, all of the, the works-oriented, legal-oriented, law system, grace, uh, uh, yeah, grace is okay, but we still got to keep the law. We're looking at a, a changeover in Paul's life where that uh, uh, he, he counts all this, and we'll see this later on in our study, that he counts it all rubbish to know Christ. We've seen that there's a bond between us as believers. That we are to, to be sincere and without offense, without blame, not just because we are, not just because God doesn't have anything against us, but because in our practical experience to live out in our lives, uh, to live out the truth of, of the fact the fact of what is true of us. I mean, uh, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is God can have nothing against us. We can be stand before God uh, spotless, and yet our lives may not reflect that reality. We've seen that uh, we're only here because God uh, feels that it's necessary that we be here for one another. That uh, for, to me, for to live is Christ. It's not, uh, you know, the focus is away from self to Christ. It's away from uh, law to grace. It's, it's, it's out of the realm of legal, the legal system, that we're not under the legal system. And that has been the consistent theme all throughout the New Testament. 
it's it's amazing it's always amazed me at just how extensive the writing is in the new testament uh, uh particularly in paul's epistles just how extensive that message is how far reaching that that message how consistent that that message is that we're not under law but under grace that we've died to the law in order that we might bear fruit unto God. That is the consistent theme. And the consistent theme is that we exalt Christ, not self. There, you know, we live under grace, not law. And we're to be of the same mind. We're called to be of that same mind with one another. Have the same affections, the same walk, be of the same mind, But the exaltation of Christ, and I, I pointed this out before, it's, it's uh, at when, when all of this is said and done, our life's work, singular, our entire life's work will be judged on how we built on that one foundation, which is Jesus Christ. The focus is on Jesus Christ. Our message is, is Jesus Christ. Our life is Christ. And, and yet so many Christians are struggling uh, today. It, it's almost heartbreaking when you consider the number of Christians today that are struggling uh, needlessly because they are immersed in a system, a world religious system that is based on human merit yet claims the title Christianity which places it in the same category as all other religions. Any religion, any world system of religion, whether pagan or Christian on, you know, pagan on the one hand or Christian on the other, any, any religious system that is based on Christian merit, and that includes much of modern Christianity today, is not biblical. Now, that's not a popular message. And, of course, out, out of that unpopular message springs forth a, uh, a, uh, a lot of, of uh, persecution, uh, disagreement, uh, conflict. Uh, we face an adversary, which is our adversary... Uh, Primarily, our adversary, Satan, is the author, very much the author behind this system of legal, this legal system of human merit. But that's not how we know Christ. And so we're going to go on with our study and we're going to look at the effects, I believe, of, of our working out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God at work in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. And what that's saying is that God has you right where he wants you at any given moment. And we're to be content in all circumstances. We're to be happy with the fact that, blessed over the fact that God is working in us. The text did not say that, that he's wor he, he'll work in us both the will and do of his good pleasure if we let him. That's not what the text is saying. In fact, I'm absolutely convinced that he's working in every single one of his children both the will and do of his good pleasure, whether they even realize it or not. It just, uh, it helps a lot to realize it. I don't know it, just how many videos uh, uh, folks I've made on uh, concerning the gospel uh, and the purity of the gospel, the, a non-synergistic, uh, purely monergistic, God-only gospel. I know there's there's been a few, and I pointed out in the past how that we were chosen in Him before there was any brain activity on our part. But it doesn't end there. What follows that is the is a contrast between law and grace, between Christ and self, between the flesh and the spirit. And that, that contrast, okay, is sown within the, and throughout the very tapestry of the New Testament. 
The emphasis is not on individual acts concerning what is right or wrong, as if the Bible is simply just nothing really, nothing more than a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, which is law. If that's how you look at the Bible, as a, a manual uh, on, on how to conduct yourselves, and and what you think that. You know you shouldn't do and you so you you go through scripture and you write down in one column everything that we're supposed to do and you write down in the other column everything we're not supposed to do and and then you set about to try to live your life as much as you can in uh, coordination with that fact that's folks that's law you're you're missing the picture of christ christ is emblazoned upon every single page of God's word. There's been a particular walk that we've been granted by grace. In fact, that walk has, was, has, was prepared beforehand for us that we should walk in it. It's his work, his perfect finished work. It's, it's one of faith. Okay. It's one of trust and rest. Rest in the finished work of Christ. Now we see this world sliding ever more into the abyss. If you're alive today and, and you're awake and, and you have some sense about yourself, you know that we're living in unprecedented times. The world is in a mess but normally when we think of that word world we automatically our minds snap to the well that's got to be talking about something outside the realm of christian faith and christian service it's really not has nothing to do the world is the world and we're the church and 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 the world is just the ungodly the wicked that doesn't know the lord and and so we define the world in that in that in that term in that sense and and i'm not saying that scripture doesn't define the world in that sense in fact the word world in the greek cosmos that that word world is used sometimes in the context of the planet earth the world sometimes it's used in the context of the ungodly and the wicked but most often the word world in scripture and particularly in those passages in which the lord used the word employed that term the world he was speaking of the world religious system based on human merit this is the world that will put you out of the synagogue thinking it's doing god a service it'll it'll put you to death thinking that it's making sacrifice to god uh I spent some time last night just sitting around thinking about that term, the world, and how it's used in Scripture and in the context of the, of that, of that religious system, that that system that's based on human merit. And it's not complicated to take a look at at our Lord's life and look at the opposition that he faced, the persecution that he encountered, and just. Determine for yourself and make the honest determination. The conclusion that, that, that you have to reach from that is that we're looking at our Savior, whose opposition, that which that system which opposed him, was one which was built upon a a system of legality of of legal merit of or that a man was justified by works of the law not not through faith and this is what he opposed and he opposed it uh, vehemently his life stood in contrast okay to that very legal system and so does ours It's a it's a pseudo Christianity. It's a uh, it's a perverted, and I think we'll see that in the text. It's a perverted, misshaped. It's it's bent out of shape. It's distorted. 
it, it's into it made into shaped into something other than what it was intended to be. It's a fabrication. It's masquerading as Christianity. And it's very good at it. If I offer my life as a sacrifice of labor within that world system of human merit, then I, I in fact, in effect, I, I become, maybe perhaps without me even realizing it, I become an object of false worship, which is myself. I'm worshiping myself. I'm worshiping the God of self. I'm worshiping my own autonomy, my ability to override the will of the Creator in my life. God's not really God. I'm, I'm, ultimately, it rests with me. And folks, I'm going to suggest that if it rested with us, we would all be in grave trouble. We know that our lives in Christ is not one in which we boast in the flesh. We know that it's not some fleshly, horrible, carnal imitation of Christ, and yet that's exactly what we see in that legal system that's based on human merit. This is a golden thread that's woven throughout the entire fabric of the New Testament, and Christian after Christian after Christian misses seeing it. And by it, I really mean Christ. They miss seeing Christ. Jesus said, you search the scriptures daily, to, you, that you think that in them that, that there is life, and yet you, you won't come unto me that you may have eternal life. I'm going to quickly go through the several verses here. Uh, start at beginning at Philippians 2.14. All things do uh, without murmurings and disputings. Without murmurings and disputings. And I'm going to suggest, folks, that I do not believe that that is primarily referring to my murmuring or complaining over over Sue not putting enough uh, butter on my cornbread. I think it's important that we understand as we go through this that we don't sidestep or abandon the immediate context and the, the, the thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey here, which is in an ecclesiastical context. This is a church context. First of all, Paul's writing to a church. Is the world as we know it, and I'm, and I'm speaking of the world as in that, the i.e. the planet, okay, or the wicked, the ungodly, those who don't know God, is it in a mess? Is it in a mess today? Well, of course it is. It's, it's in a, an, an enormous mess. But the world religious system is likewise in a mess. Because it misses seeing Christ. We are to do all things without murmurings and disputings. That is in the word in the Greek, uh, uh, dia, dia legismos. It's, it's, it's a... <coughs> I am not going to rash, try to rationalize this whole concept of, of Christ being my life and me being under grace, not law, and me being dead to the law in order that I, I might be bear fruit unto God. I'm not going to try to rationalize all this, this, this by, or I'm, I'm not going to try to understand. I don't want to be trying to understand all of that or question it or doubting it, question, questioning the, the, the wondrous truths of God's grace. Try to, try to figure all that out and sort all that out and try to, 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 to get a clear understanding of, of how all that can be through natural reasoning. I'm not going to... The murmuring and, and disputing, I believe, is... We, can, we see this in the context of what just occurred. What just, what this followed 
our working out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God at work in us, both the will and do of his good pleasure. And be based upon that enormous and, and most important fact that he's sovereign. I don't believe, I'm, I, I believe that I'm being told in a Christian context that there shouldn't be any murmuring or disputing over that fact. There shouldn't be any, any argument. It doesn't serve, it, it is profitless. It, it, it doesn't serve any purpose, any use for us to try to wrangle through that uh, in our our natural mind of reasoning it's it's we've got you know our our fleshly mind can go one way uh, a way that's contrary to what the word of god says it's well god's forgiven me of all my sins yeah that's wonderful but i don't know i, I need to think i need to i need to well you know there may be some murmuring and there, there may be some disputing over that God says, don't let there be. So when it comes to that, to facing the reality of, uh, uh, of our existing, our being in the world, we're not of the world, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. That world that, that hates us, that would put us to death thinking it's doing God a, a service. This whole idea of religion that's based on human merit, we're simply talking law. We're basically talking about law, the very opposite of God's grace. Um, this is what you would do under law. There would be murmurings and there would be disputings. Moreover, I believe that if we're living under grace, and we, we understand that God, well, God is working in us both the will and do of his good pleasure. But, but, but man, I, you know, it's, it's, now I'm in a situation that I don't like being in. This is not a very pleasant situation. And I wish God would just take and just lift me up out of it, remove me from it. I don't want to have to go through this. This is a very unpleasant experience. I can see where murmurings and disputings would come into that. Verse 15. So that you may be blameless and innocent. Children is the word in the original text. And oh, in, in your King James, it probably says sons of God. The word is techno, it's children. We are innocent children. So that you may be blameless. Well, I thought we already were. I don't know, I must have said it, if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times. We are uh, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. God has nothing against us. He was, the Father was fully propitiated by the work that Christ did on our behalf. He's forgiven us of all our sins, past, present, and future, cast them behind His back. He says He remembers them no more. We, this is so that we may be blameless and that there's a subjunctive mood in the text the mood of uncertainty maybe we will maybe we won't be blameless and innocent children of god unblemished that's without spot so it's talking about in our experience what is true folks in all in reality may not surface in our daily walk what God says is true of us, that we're, we do stand before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That may not, our lives, our walk, our relationship with the Lord may not reflect that fact. And I believe that the Holy Spirit, through Paul, toward the Philippians, is talking about so that we may be, maybe we will, maybe we won't be blameless and innocent children of God spotless and i'm going to suggest that it's it's simply saying that maybe our lives will maybe they will reflect live up to what is true of us maybe they won't but it's the holy spirit's desire that that 
be the case, that we live as who we are. Innocent children of God, unblemished, that is without spot, in the midst of, and the word is a generation. Now that word is used a, a lot. It's, it's, it's where we get the word Genesis, but it's, it's in the midst of a generation, crooked. Well, the word simply means what, it, what you think it means. It means bent, okay? Uh, best illustration I could give you is, you, you know, you, you take a, an aluminum rod and it's you straight and then you bend it and, well, it's, it's bent. I mean, that's, that's, well, that, that took a lot of thinking, didn't it? I mean, it's just, it's bent, folks, out of shape. It's not, there is a walk. It's a straight and narrow walk, a straight walk, the walk that he's laid out before us. That's the walk that we're to walk. There is a walk that's not the way that we should walk. And, and this world lies in the midst of this. And we lie in the midst of this. This is a generation that is crooked. It's bent. It's out of shape. And it's perverted. And that word, word perverted means just what it means. It's distorted. It's misshaped. Okay? It's a perverted, misshaped fabrication masquerading as Christianity. This is whom we shine as lights in the world, in that world system. Now, am I going to suggest that the word world there does not include the world in general? No, I'm not. But what I'm going to suggest is that when we, when we keep and we, we stay consistent with the theme, with the subject that's being discussed, when we stay true to the context of this passage, that I would suggest that it, the, the mind of the Holy Spirit is the, the message that we're, that we're being given here is the word world is primarily re referring to primarily that world religious system based on human merit. That's what we lie in the midst of. And that's what we shine as lights, as luminaries in. This is the effect. This is the effect. Now, I'm not sure if I should say, well, this is the effect of us, of us really understanding verses 12 and 13. You know, that we're working out our deliverance from, from human merit with fear and trembling, knowing it is God at working in, working in us both the will and do of his good pleasure. Therefore, we shine as lights in the world. I'm not sure I can say that. I, I, I'm going to suggest that, and this is what I believe, and I don't ask anybody to, to agree with me, every single child of God, regardless of their maturity level, regardless of their understanding of Scripture, regardless of their the, the amount of faith that they've that. God is by grace invested in their lives. They still, nevertheless, remain and always will be, will, will shine as lights in the world. Why is this? Because they stand in this world, we stand in this world as a testimony to what God has done in our lives whether we realize it or not, or whether anyone else realizes that or not. The word of life holding forth, says the text, says the next, we're looking at verse 16, the word of life, the word of life. You know, it sounds kind of like, reminds me of, you know, where I've watched a Western on TV and, and some uh, Calvary, some, somebody like Clint Eastwood, you know, is... is is uh is talking to an indian chief and the indian chief is talking about the word of life the word of life you know it's, it's sounds kind of like an indian phrase i mean at least it does to me the single word that's not words of life i want you to take note and and it's important that we as we go through these verses that we actually take time to look to see if something is singular or plural it's the single word, singular, of life. 
And that life, zoe, that life is a genitive. It has to refer in the text to someone, which it does in the verse itself where we see another genitive uh, mentioned in where it says in the day of Christ. We know that Christ is the word of life. The single word of life is Christ, is what the text is saying. That's what we hold forth. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's marvelous to see that in the text, just that phrase, the word of life holding forth, is us holding forth Christ. That's what we do. The text literally literally states that, that that's we hold forth that word of life into a boast. Okay? The word is boast. To me, in the day of Christ. That's our boast. In the day of Christ, your boast won't be in a legal system, a religious system that was based on human merit. The only boast that you will have, or should have, is in Christ. We rejoice in Christ. That not in vain I did run, says Paul, nor in vain toil. So we've got two things to look at, running and toiling. This word run, uh, treko in the Greek, it's, 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 used, it's like an athlete competing in the ancient Greek games. Uh, figuratively, uh, it means to advance speedily. It's like, it's like an athlete moving forward with full effort and with a directed purpose. It's running wide open, okay? It's, it, a, it conveys this intense desire to get to the goal as quickly as possible. That's, that's what we're looking at there. And the word toil, that's to grow weary. That's bodily, uh, mental, labor, uh, both. It's, it's exhausting labor. It's, you know, the, the word uh, uh, there in the, in the Greek, uh, kapiao, it's, it's exhausting labor. It's, it's the labor until you're worn out, you're depleted, you're completely, absolutely exhausted, okay? That's the idea, okay? And, and it's Paul's concern that he did not run nor labor in vain, Okay? And that should be our desire as well. And that is a solemn verse, folks, because what that is saying is it's saying that it's possible that we can run and, and labor ourselves. We're talking exhaustive labor where we grow weary. We're completely spent, totally exhausted, but it's all been in vain. And that's what law does. But if even I am being poured out as a drink offering, we can stop right there. It's, it's a libation, the word in, in the Greek. Many of you probably are familiar with the idea of, of pouring out a libation. It's sort of an offering uh, uh, for, you know, people will do that. Uh, when someone that they loved passed away, they'll pour out a, uh, some alcohol out on the ground, you know, in honor of that person. It's, but it's, it's, it's Paul's life being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of their faith. Poured out as a drink offering, a sacrifice and a drink offering. I suppose there's a lot that could be said about that. I think just to keep it simple, I would suggest that if we're living our lives under grace, not law, and our message and our ministry is Christ, not self, then we are, our lives mirror the text, the verse. Poured out as a drink offering 
on the sacrifice and service of the faith of you. And it goes on and says, I am glad. The word Cairo there in the Greek, it's, it's the word for grace. I am graced. Okay? And rejoice. That's rejoicing in Christ with all of you. Verse 18, and likewise also you be glad. Again, we see the word grace. Be glad, be graced, and rejoice with me. <coughs> I guess maybe I jumped backwards. Didn't mean to do that. If we go on to verse, to verse 18, and likewise also you be glad. Okay. And rejoice with me. That's verse 18. I hope, however, in the Lord Jesus, Timothy soon to send to you that I also may be encouraged. And we, we just, we encourage one another. And I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. We're looking at the effects, folks, of our implicit trust in God's sovereign direction and control, will, working in our lives, whether we realize it or not, it was important, I believe, because it leads to the effect that Paul describes after verses 12 and 13. This is the result of a life of faith. Okay, This is the result of a ministry whose focus is on Christ, not self. I, I, constant, I am constantly amazed at just how the Holy Spirit presents these truths to us it's not it's not just that the truths themselves are marvelous it's the way that he goes about writing through paul speaking through paul they're they're full of grace full of mercy there is nothing cond you would think that after something as important as work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it's God at work in you both the will and do, you would think that the, the Holy Spirit would follow up with that up with some warning, okay? Of, he doesn't do that, really. Oh, the warning's there. But it's, there's nothing con condemnatory. There's nothing in the passage that would, that would, really f even find fault with a brother or a sister who, who is unaware of the fact that God is sovereign in our, in our lives, in, in their lives. It's, do you understand, folks, just how horrible uh, a situation would occur if we, are to, if we were to look at our brother and our sister in Christ, point to, oh, uh, let's say, I don't know, pick a name, Fred, over here and Fred he, he doesn't he, he's not he's not living his life as, as though uh, God is working in him both the will and do of his good pleasure he's not really working out his salvation his deliverance from that 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 human merit system with fear and trembling and so but I am I am and and so I, I look I look at my brother or my sister, I look at them as a little less than myself. I look at them as, as something a little beneath myself. Well, they're just not, they just don't quite have it together like I do. That's, it's a pity, it's a shame, and I, I wish they did. The question I, I would pose to you would be, does God love them any less? Is He working in their lives and listen, dearly beloved, is he working in their lives both, is he not working in their lives just as he is in yours, both the will and do of his good pleasure? Well, absolutely he is. If they are his children, if they are children of God, that's what God is doing. God does not wait on us some response on our part, ever, okay? Well, if, you know, before God display showers some some form of grace on our lives it's it's wrong thinking 
to take and put the cart before the horse and say, well, if we would, if, if man, if, if look at us, we're working out our salvation, our deliverance from human merit uh, with fear and trembling, because we know what it means to, we, fear and trembling, it's, it, makes, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense, because we, we know, we know that, uh, well, no wonder he said fear and trembling, because we know what the effects of that human merit system does in our lives. It doesn't bring peace, joy, you know, uh, contentment, uh, rest. You know, it's uh, it doesn't free us. Well, you know, to be free from worry and to be free from guilt. And, and man, it's it's and man, we've somehow achieved that. We've scaled that mountaintop. Okay, we have. Okay, but our brothers and sisters over here, they have not. And so, man, there's, we're, now we're, we're, the temptation is overwhelming to look at ourselves and, and just try to come up with something that in ourselves that surely must have deserved that grace. Do you honestly think that God works in a believer's life? If he's dumber than you are, is God still working in that believer's life? The same way he's working in yours. Does he not love that brother the same? D does his grace not cover also that brother, your brother in Christ? No wonder there's to be no murmuring and disputing, folks. No wrangling. No trying to figure out through through some mean, some rational means. You know, some human logic. We we just got to get that old human logic to work, and we've got to figure out. You know, make sense of this from a standpoint of, of, of human reasoning. Folks, there's nothing logical about any of this. That's, that's the most amazing thing about Christianity itself. It is the most illogical system that the world's ever known because it just doesn't make any sense that God would, would, would bless us so abundantly, so greatly uh, when we lived our lives so horribly. That just doesn't make any sense. What The only thing that makes sense is God blesses us when we're good and He, and he doesn't when we're bad. That, now that makes sense. And we've got to cast that off, folks. As a new creation in Christ, we cannot go through our lives trying to understand, trying to figure things out from a human perspective and say, well, yeah, it just doesn't make sense, so that can't be true. God's forgiven me of all my trespasses, past, present, and future. He's, he's buried, in, buried them in the depths of the sea. He says he's, he's cast them as far as the east is from the west. He'll remember, he, he remembers them no more, okay? He doesn't even remember them, but, but we do. We do, and, it's not, and it only makes sense that we do. That's natural reasoning, okay? That's murmuring. That's disputing. If, if you Greek students out there, take a good look at that word disputing, and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's, it's trying to rationalize things from a human perspective. The natural man's reasoning. We've got to get the natural man's reasoning at work to try to figure out the, mo the, mo the, more spirit the, 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 mo the most spiritual things that God could could. Could communicate with us. Let me take a moment here to say that I love you all. I truly do. I, I want to just thank you so much for those of you who have followed this channel and are sincere about feasting upon God's Word and growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are my family. And not only mine, but 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 fam we are all family members, and God has us scattered around the globe in small bands, small bands of followers. You're not following me, but we're following Christ. But the imitation, the reflection of, of our lives today is so identical to the to what we see in the picture of Christ and his followers that it's astounding. And I hope that you see that. I hope that you see that God, God had no intention of gathering all of those who believe in grace like, like we do all together and get them all together in one place.
place. And well, we can just have a uh, you know create this colony, this uh, this this uh, homestead, this uh, this uh, I don't know what what do you call it. Well, let me just say that it would be a cult. Okay. We would become isolationists. We would, be, we, would, we would become a closed society of believers that didn't allow any of that to come inside. Okay? And that is not the picture that you see. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. There's a reason why God didn't take us out of that world religious system. We are going, folks, if your desire is to, is to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to, to stand face to face with that opposition for the rest of the time that you're here. There's, there's, no, there's no shelter from that. We're not seeking, uh, you know, uh, to be sheltered from persecution anymore, you know, in the same sense that we would, would be looking for shelter to shelter us from a storm that's that's not god's in, intent god's intent god's purpose is to put us right in the midst of that conflict and it may not be comfortable and if the conflict is not external it's certainly going to be internal the conflict will be w within yourself it always is the flesh and the spirit okay you're going to question God's work in your life. There's going to be times where doubt enters in to the picture. Well, I know what God says, but it's just a little too hard for me to believe. Or maybe I've believed this for many, many years, but then suddenly some, God allows some circumstance. He thrusts me into some situation to, to test that faith. And well, I just failed miserably. And of course, now now that I failed him, you know, I didn't trust him. Well, then, uh, you know, uh, I'm certainly not. I'm gonna gonna reap some sort of benefit from that uh, benefit. I put that in quotes. I mean, you know, it's God can't be. We know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay. On the other hand, God is fully pleased with us. He, we've been accepted in the beloved. I don't have any problem telling you that God has nothing against you, and yet He's not pleased when you walk by, by, by law. He's not pleased with you in the sense of your walk. Uh, of uh, your, If you believe that, you've, uh, that you have to earn God's grace uh, by what you do, you know, that it, it's, you know, if you, if you live under that umbrella of that legal system, that religious system based on human merit, if you haven't learned any better, the result of that that we see in the Word is an entire a believer's entire life's work, singular being burned up at Bama, yet he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire they will stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Why? Because of what Christ did. Period. I believe that this whole entire New Testament, this covenant of grace, this, co this new, new covenant that we live under, where that God is not even imputing our trespasses against us, the grace and the mercy and the love of God that we see on every single page of this book, you know, it seems like as if we just spent our time focused on that and... and and not as much time focused on the on the failure of the flesh, which that's all the flesh will do, would would make a giant leap forward here. I just want to say that I appreciate all of you in, in more ways than you know. I've never really been one for uh you know, for being too uh, I don't know, overly dramatic as far as my feelings toward others goes or or anything like that but I do have to tell you that you people my family in the Lord you are on my mind constantly day and night 
I pray for you constantly. I so ask for your, your prayers concerning the direction of this ministry. I appreciate every single one of you that leave me a comment. You have no idea how encouraging those comments are to me. I don't know what the future holds, folks, but I do know as, as far as outward circumstances go. But what I do know is I do know that if you belong to the Lord, if you are one of God's children, God promised us a life of peace and joy and rest. Okay, A walk that He prepared beforehand. That's the work of Christ, and that's what we we walk in that work of His. Okay? It's easy to take and look at the, the word world here in this text and say, you know, well, that's all that junk that we see going on around us today. And believe me, there's a lot of that. Folks, I don't want you, I, I don't want you to be oblivious to what's happening around the world, but I or in your country, or in your community. But what I do want you, I don't want you to be oblivious to that, but I don't want that to be your primary focus. I want your focus to be on the context, okay? This, is, this was written to a church. The context is ecclesiastical. The context is Christian, okay? I don't think that the Holy Spirit in this passage had on his mind the world, i.e. the planet, or the wicked or the ungodly. I don't think that's his primary focus or concern. I wouldn't I don't think I would never suggest that, that it's not included in that. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. We're not, well, obviously we're not, we're not of that wicked, perverted generation. We're not, we're not in the world, we're not of the world in the sense the, of that we're not, we're not, we're not a part of the wicked. We're not a part of the ungodly. That's true. But what we are in the midst of a, a religious system that's based on human merit, but we are not part of that. And, it, and it, it is that system that comes against, the, that opposes the grace of God, the sovereignty of God. You wouldn't think today, going to, to, you know, if you visited most churches, you wouldn't think that, that God was sovereign at all. You would, you would probably, most likely leave, come away from that church, from that ministry, with the idea that, that ultimately man holds the final trump card. And folks, that is just not the case. Okay, I'm out of time. Once again, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. And until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.